Aloha. <laughs> Welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. And today we're looking at the future of sustainable development, the United Nations High Level Political Forum. And I'm so fortunate to be joined today by Rili, who's heading up as the director of FINGO, looking at Finnish sustainable development NGOs. We are here at the United Nations headquarters for the UN High Level Political Forum. And it's a two week global gathering, bringing together community, cities, capitals, and civil society. Why does FINGO come to this important high level political forum? And what are some of the highlights so far? I think it is a really important place to be because this is the place where the world comes together and then really thinking about the sustainable development. And the whole idea for every year to come here is to really follow a little bit on the progress that how the member states are really doing the sustainable development. So some of the countries are reporting voluntarily what they're doing. So it's some kind of um, showcase that how the progress has went go on. But also it's an opportunity for the other stakeholders like civil society where I'm coming from. So it's really important place for us to come together, but also talking with the member states, with academics, with, with other stakeholders like local authorities or others, also to get a little bit temperature check at where we are at the moment globally, because mainly in many cases, you are just following your own member state. But now we get a little bit some kind of feeling on that where the world, whole world goes. It's true. So the exciting part is there are 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and these voluntary national reviews are when governments of the world decide that they will share on how they are developing and how close they're getting to achieve the 2030 agenda. What were some of the highlights of different countries that may be shared so far this week? And what are some of the aspects on the earlier VNRs of Finland that were so innovative that captured the world's imagination? Yeah, actually Finland reported a second time in 2020. Uh, that was unfortunately still during the COVID, where exactly the HLPF, uh, this high-level political forum, was organized by virtually. So it was a little bit different on that. Not so good that you really physically meet the colleagues and, and other people all over the world on there. But but even though I, I think it's really important that the report was made, because it really, really tells about the political commitment as, as well, that how exactly the governments and the member states, including all the actors from the societies, are, are really making the progress on, on that. And exactly the really the uniqueness of, of that report was that uh, we as a civil society, we look collected our analysis of all those 17 goals and, and they also have the 169 targets under the goals. So we made our report and analysis and government made their own. But exactly the Finnish civil society report is part of the official report. So it is quite quite tough thing, I would say. And and it was totally, there were no changes made by the government. So exactly every commas and everything what we have put to the report, it's, it's there, like we wrote it. And I, I think that that tells quite a lot about the trust also in, in the monks of, of the Finnish society, that exactly our even sometimes critical report, it's, it's showcased and, and tell to the world that yes, exactly there are different point of view, but at the same time, exactly, there's, there were quite a lot of similarities as well. So the analysis made by the, let's say, the some certain ministries and the civil society side, they were totally in, in the spot. So the same messages came out. And one of those, of course, is that we all, the Northern uh, citizens, we are consuming absolutely too much. So so our footprints is really horrible. And, and that's that's one of the cases where we have a lot to do. No, and that's one of the exciting parts about the UN Global Goals is that it's no longer looking at development by going over a border and looking at something over there, but you just can cross a bridge in your own country and that the sustainable development goals are applicable to all countries and that every country has to work hard to make sure these 17 global goals become part of their domestic and foreign policy. Exactly, and and that's why I, I think that it's it's really it's it's very inspiring as as well because it's not something which is happening out of the country, but it's something where every human being wherever he or she is living can also contribute and be 
be part of, of that. So in, in that way, I, I think that it's really, first of all, it's the only way how we can really uh, save the planet and really living in the meaningful life on here. But it also brings and, and connects us all over the world between the human beings, individuals, wherever we are. We have, we have a lot of commonalities. And, and that's why I think that it's so important that, that every single person is, is somehow aware first of all aware and then when you when you are aware and hopefully you get the interest and uh, you're, you're ready to really the participate and and really making your best so that, that we can really find a good solutions for all of us in in this planet and you came up with some really good points the that your report was considered part of the official report shows a certain level of a standard which then allows all other civil society to push their government to say if Finland lets civil society's report be considered and included, why can't you include? Because most people don't even have consultations, don't meet with civil society, don't bring the voice of the people in. So you, yours, if they include the report, there must be a whole lot more with consultations. Maybe you could share in the last year how it was prepared in 2020 before COVID and the, the first one, how the government meets with and what are the benefits of those creative consultations where the people get to meet with the government but have really good really sharing truthfully what needs to be done and a real deep analysis but also exploring of the soul of the nation yeah it, it was really really um participatory way so so exactly the finger was in the coordination role amongst of the civil society organizations and that was also good for us because we we are majority of our members are working abroad so doing the development project etc so it was also good for us so that exactly we managed to do the same what we are asking the governments to do so getting the internal and external together so that was one one element on that, but also it was that, that we were checking with the UN statistics and the Finnish statistics as, as well. So in that way, exactly the sources of information what we used or what the ministries used was the same as, as well. And then we are, of course, very grateful that we have very, very good uh, statistic institution in, in Finland. So they, we have the data comparing for many other countries. So it's really, really helpful. But of course, we wanted to really uh, get more information. So exactly as a part of, of the report, there's also the contribution from the young people. Uh, there used to be the so-called citizens panel, where exactly whoever been a citizen uh, has a, had an opportunity to, to participate and give the, some kind of feeling how I'm feeling that Finland is, is doing. So it was the collection of, of different kind of sources and, and through the participatory way, people really felt that, okay, we've been heard or not here, and then and we, we have the opportunities to give the contribution on that. But it's been really, um, I, I would say that the point really is the process because that really allows people to participate. And, and then it's also at the same time, it's it's commit yourself on, on that because you, your interest is increasing and then you might be interested to follow that in, in the future as, as well. And, and even be, be hopefully, get some kind of inspiration to activate the finding your ways, how you can even better way and, and different ways to do uh, more and more sustainable ways. So I, I do hope that that that's, uh, could be the example for the other countries as well. And when you describe it, it, it is the process and the protest process then allows for really a proactive participatory inclusion in public policy and it sort of redefines politics where Normally, it's, it's just looking at what's good for the next election, but by this process of everybody being able to engage and having the same language of each goal, it allows you then to really bring a new type of citizen diplomacy and to be able to be involved to shape the domestic and foreign policy as well. Absolutely, and I, I think that it also brings the policies much more closer to the citizens reality because like you said that normally you are just uh, criticizing because i'm not really getting the services from from the government but it also gives you a little bit better understanding of exactly what's going on there and what exactly are the in in the more in the detail level the policies and then that's why i i think that it was also interesting because definitely those um 
sustainable development goals when when they were negotiated and when the governments were agreed on that it really varies between the, the member states in the world because indeed definitely Mali and, and Finland is a totally different kind of uh, situation. So not all the goals or their, their targets are not so super relevant for each of the country, but you need to choose which really matters most for you. And and some kind of next phase where we are going on in, in Finland at the moment is that exactly we just uh, uh, finalized during the spring um, some kind of roadmap from this year now in 2022 uh, by 2030 because the the deadline for achieving sustainable development goals is 2030 at the moment and and definitely even the Finland has a lot to do and and exactly as a part of of this analysis again the whole stakeholders together um, draw the um, roadmap and and that's a little bit different now. So we we found out those areas where Finland definitely need to really speed up, not trying to really pick every single things because, for example, there one of the targets is the, the uh, cases of malaria, which we don't really have in Finland. So in that way, it's, it's irrelevant. But there are many other ones thinking about the energy system, for for example. That's that's really really matters in Finland. So exactly, we uh, found out six thematic areas, which are more like the system level thinking, like the energy system or, or food system. And, and one of those those areas around education, education, civilization, uh, consumption habits. So really thinking the education in the large understanding, including the lifelong learning and, and, and the formal, non-formal, informal learning. But the point really is that what we need to do from now until 2030 so that we can really boost and, and really, really get the goals to be uh, achieved by 2030. And this work is now starting in the second half of, of this year. And it will be really, really exciting because, again, it's not only the government who need to implement that, but it's all our actors. It's including the business, uh, private sector, uh, it's civil society, academics, local authorities, everyone. And, and that is the whole issue on, on, on this Agenda 2030 implementation that everybody's needed. And it really does make sure that we're all speaking the same language because Indeed. we're all talking about the goals, but we can all apply them to our professional lives, either at the university, or at the business, and then also even individual actions, looking at mm -hmm. SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and practices. It's how we live on a daily basis. So these SDGs as a framework, as you're saying, really does allow us to focus and that deadline. I think that's an important one that people don't think of enough. It's yeah. 2030. So it's next year will be the, the halfway point. But as you brought up, it really gets us to consider what more could we do? And when you mentioned that aspect of 2020, it reminded me of Hawaii. We became the first state to do a voluntary local review. And, and we're similar. You know, We wish we were in the UN. But then the positive aspect for our voluntary local review was there was no limit. No next group was coming in. So we really took three hours, which is what we probably should have for a voluntary national review or a voluntary local review. And we had everyone share and discuss and then ask each other questions and listen to one another. And if that's one thing that the SDGs do, they bring everyone to the table and make sure that everyone's included. And I think those speeches in the language of leave no one behind and furthest mm. behind first force us to make sure we have a human rights-based approach in what we do. And maybe you could share a little bit on how the voluntary local review is also a good model in Finland to be able to have really municipal multilateralism and how then the cities can be catalysts to achieve the 2030 agenda. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that really the point what you mentioned about this is having the dialogue because that's exactly is super relevant and it's, it's really the way how the people can feel that I'm part of something and I, I have the opportunities to influence us as well. I'm, I'm not only the tick the box exercise, but it, it could be really that I can really make the meaningful contribution. And secondly, exactly 
no one of us are not really expert of every single topic in in the world so we need different kind of knowledge as well and and build on on that we can really move on and finding the new innovations which we are definitely needed thinking about this environment where we're living where exactly there's a lot of different kind of changes happening and nobody doesn't really know exactly where to go on and how to move how to move on how to find the solution so in in that way the dialogue and and really some kind of uh, co-creation is so important on that and and exactly also in in the in the Finnish case it's it's really important one that the the, the cities um the smaller the big ones and even the towns they they hopefully find even more we only have the five cities so far in Finland who has made the report uh but i i just heard that there are more to come which is great so in in somehow there there has been the the cities has been some kind of um uh, co-facilitators for the next city so it is also good that you can really take the some kind of example of course you can't copy paste again but but you can get inspiration and finding your way to do that because again if the countries are different of course the cities and towns are are different as, as well that, that there might be some similarities on that but indeed uh, you you need to find your 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 way how how, how to go on but there's a lot of things which is really really uh, practically thinking about that what other services what what the city council for example will offer but how the people can really give the feedback meaningful feedback on that and making those services better uh, there are some cities there are examples about this, some kind of um, budgeting where the city, uh, citizens can give the uh, um, uh, proposals where they think that the common budget should be allocated or part of, of that for example making the more more spot places or or whatever that kind of thing so I, I think that it's really really great because you can really influence on your environment where you are living and definitely of course the whole energy issue is, is really in a turbulence situation you know, all over the world at the moment so that's that's really is the place where we definitely need to find a different kind of and hopefully renewable sources how, how to really make it happen in a, in a better way and it's true, it kind of brings together the human rights based approach with the global goals and bringing the global goals to the ground. And that example you use is really a participatory budget approach. So normally budgets are passed and people can never mention a line. Mm -hmm. But this approach that you're sharing about what's going on in Finland and other places with their voluntary local reviews is people actually can have a say and actually shape their local municipal laws, but more importantly, where the funds are going and what's prioritized, and then be able to then feel that their rights are actually being respected and protected and even maybe fulfilled in this new process. Exactly, and I, I think that this is, is really important one because it's also a little bit motivation for paying taxes and then and, and feeling somehow that, okay, I, I know why I'm paying my taxes and it's good for all of us. It is part of the good governance and rule of law and, and these kind of things, which again is really the, the foundation for, for the implementation of the human rights. So in, in that way, I, I think that the some kind of theoretical discussions comes much more real. And, and it's, it's really concrete and you can really understand that, okay, what does it really mean in, in practice, in my life and my point of view? And when you shared the vast experience you've had with the global goals. You were there to be able to create them, to work on the negotiations. And it, it might not seem revolutionary for many, but to think we came from the UN Millennium Development Goals with only eight and trying to have everything to agreement in 2015 to have 17 global goals, no poverty, zero hunger, good health, well-being, quality education, gender justice, all those important ones, clean water and sanitation. We really have economic, social, cultural rights. We have fair economy. We have climate action, life below land, life above. We have SDG 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And then 17, which you've really been able to share a lot about with partnerships. It is a whole new roadmap, as you shared earlier, but provides the blueprints for a better society. And that's one of the exciting aspects of what your group works on. How was it to be able to shape global policy and negotiate to get all 17 when we know many countries didn't want a lot of those? And I, I think it's it's still, and that again, uh, the countries varies quite a lot on, on that because definitely again, the circumstances are so different. 
And um, I have a little bit feeling at the moment that because there has been so many crises like the COVID, the climate crisis, is, uh, the, there's more wars uh, and, and conflicts in, in the world nowadays than um, exactly the biggest number after uh, 1945. We have the biggest number of the conflicts in the world at the moment. So exactly there are the crises going on almost every corner of, of the world. And that definitely... Uh, really makes impact on the people's life on that and that is shaking the whole whole situation and somehow there is a little bit feeling that that we are moving a bit back to the millennium development goals because there are really huge need and and really thinking about the progress what was on the good line uh before let's say the uh, the covid um uh, there were for example this goal number 1 the the poverty uh, it was it was going up, so so we were really getting less and less poverty. But now, unfortunately, during the COVID, exactly during that time, we have went back 20 years, which is really bad news. And it really, really means that we we need to make extra efforts so that people stay alive. So so really, really starting from that kind of fundamental issue on there and then the similar what is happening at the moment with the food crisis where where there's really really horrible situations in many places in the world thanks for the uh, the speed uh, climate change effort as well so so we have this fundamental crisis happening at, at the world and and definitely we need we need to have the common global responsibility as as well to to help the people where, who are in the most uh, vulnerable situations but at the same time, we need to really find the new ways how we are making so-called transformation happening so that exactly using the technology, using the innovations, using the, the resources, we have a, more money in, in the world than ever, but it needs to be used in the right way and, and really for the good purpose, not for the military, for example, where it goes quite heavily at, at the moment, but, but really using that in, in that way that exactly no one is not left behind and, and then we, we really respect the, the um, uh, nature and, and the environment and, and trying to find the solutions which really make sure that exactly both the nature and the human beings can live together in, in harmony in, in this planet. But I think that we need to really have quick solutions as well, because definitely, of course, all the alarms are ringing there. And I think that we definitely need to really find the solutions which sustain, which are not going back, but is, is, is taking all of us on board and, and moving in the right direction in a sustainable way. And when you talked about it, it really goes back to the UN Charter, that collective responsibility, because Absolutely. at the end of World War II, it was, if something bad is happening to your neighbor, we all need to step up because it might not seem like it'll affect you, yeah. but it'll ripple. And so all these aspects of what's happening are now all showing the wisdom that was there in the UN Charter. And now, really, it's an amendment. The 2030 Agenda is an amendment to that UN Charter to then look at some of the more modern challenges, but to keep that same sense of solidarity, that spirit of caring for one another. And it's not charity, but it's truly caring mm. and coming together because what impacts one impacts us all. It's sort of that Ubuntu philosophy. Exactly, yeah. we, are, we are so interlinked all the time. So no one is not anymore alone in, in the planet. So we, we, we are the part of the, several systems at the same time and there's so many linkages between the different both the individuals but also the topics and, and products and whatever we are doing everything is so interlinked at, at the moment and that's why i think that it really matters that what is happening happening in honolulu it's really affects in helsinki as, as well it's true i remember us talking helsinki honolulu people are like <laughs> how is that connected but we have indigenous peoples we also are looking at climate, but what mm -hmm, impact mm -hmm. your climate might be different, but it's the same aspect to show how our lives are really one. And that's the exciting part is with these SDGs, it allows us to then say, what can we do together? How mm -hmm. can our actions in Hawaii help? What could we do together to really impact the global arena? Because being here and seeing thousands of people coming from all over the world, it's kind of a full schedule. Can you maybe sort of walk us through? I know at eight o'clock, you got major groups meetings and then mm -hmm. there's another meeting and then there's another meeting. So mm -hmm. what's it like to be a citizen diplomat and 
what's it like to be part of this high level political forum with the over four dozen uh, voluntary national reviews? What are some of those aspects? Maybe share with us what it's like to what the schedule is. I think that is first of all, it's absolutely great to see the people. I, I think that we are all, all, every one of us, we have lacked on that, that we are only in the Zooms or somewhere else. So it's, it's really, really great to see the real people and they're really, really talking. And, and, and then, because they, I was just talking with, with somebody that exactly in a half an hour discussions, what we had face to face, we were much more creative and then we managed to solve so many issues immediately. So it's much more effective as, as well. And, and definitely this is also the opportunity that we are learning from each other because that is the whole point that why we come together is that we are learning and we're trying to find out about the common solutions. Again, not copy pasting, but at least the idea and, and then finding the ways how we can really, really move on. But I, I think that it's definitely a worth of using around the clock time to, together when we finally can can really meet. And, and, and that's exactly as part of, of the coordination as well, because the one of the really the beauty of, of this uh, high level political forum around Agenda 2030 is that it's quite unique structure in the UN system as well, because not very often in the UN meetings, exactly all the stakeholders are under the same uh, roof and then really meeting people, because in many cases they are in separate rooms. So the member states and governments are talking to each other, then the civil society is talking to each other, but there's no conversation or dialogue going on. And that's really, I, I think that it's, it's really witnessing and then walk the talk of the agenda 2030 the philosophy, because they're in, in this uh, whole um, idea of the Agenda 2030, it's, it's there are fundamentally five important P's, which is people, planet, prosperity, partnership, and uh, what is the now, the fifth P, I forget it now. Um, prosperity? Prosperity, yeah. And I, I think that that's, that's really tells quite a lot on, on that, because you you need to think about all these aspects at the same time and that is the whole logic that it's not only the technical exercise that that we are following the indicators under these goals and targets and just tick the box if it's done or not but it's also about this thinking all these aspects at the same time and that i i think that 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 happens quite well of course you can always do that better but i, I think that in principle there's a try to implement that also on this ways of organizing the work under these two weeks uh, events and, and meetings what we're having. So there are the opportunities for, for different stakeholders to have the dialogue and, and trying together. Of course, there are the, the criticism coming and, and there are where the civil society or somebody else is challenging the governments on there. But it's, it's part of, of this game. It's part of this dialogue, what we're trying to move on collectively not in that way that only only governments are in charge of, of the implementation. Definitely, they have the very, very important role on there, but also the other actors can really do a lot on that. But I, I think that it's needed that there's some kind of mini world is coming together and then we have a little bit like the laboratory where we are testing the principles in practice. It's true. And then we are one year away from the Sustainable Development Goals Summit. What would you say should be a aspiration of civil society to come together for the SDG summit? What's some things we have to include? I think that the really, now like I, I mentioned already about this, this catastrophic situations where we have really went back on, on the, the goals at the moment. I, I think that there has to be, uh, be the more uh, ways and opportunities to really find the solutions which really get us back to the track. So it's, it's really, really important that, that we are not only going with those who, who has their good opportunities for, for living in, in this planet, but really taking this, that nobody is not really left behind. So that's really is a very, very important one that the, the most fragile uh, and vulnerable uh, human beings are really taking account on that. So that's that's really is the big worry coming from, from the civil society side. Of course, the others, other one is that unfortunately, uh, all the statistics shows that exactly there's a really uh, increasing uh, shrinking space for civil society. So there's less and less um, member states in the world who has a 
have some really free space for citizens to be heard and, and participate and criticize and discuss and, and, and be active on that. And that's really, really worrying. Uh, and COVID definitely make the boost for, for that. So there's still, even if, if the, uh, the COVID is not anymore so uh, so horrible situation, still the rules are there, which means that exactly there's less and less opportunities for people to really uh, participate and, and, and act on that way. So unfortunately, this trend is not a very good one at, at the moment. And I I, I think and definitely this is one of, of the worry coming coming from the civil society side. And, and for example, today we, we they heard some stories from the uh, Belarus and, and Russian civil society uh, who also Tell. Of course, we know that, but it's really, really good that they were heard and they had, they had opportunities to say this aloud as well. No, it's true that all of the human rights are really brought out, and it's great to hear multiple countries and civil society using the human rights lens in this work, yep. in this giant laboratory. Thank you so much for sharing from the Arctic, also talking about what's going on with Fingo and how you're able to then share that model with others so that we can build a global movement for justice, equality, and equity for all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Joshua. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.